what is called age-related memory. Welcome to our program tonight, a special edition of the Charlie Rose Brain Series, Year 2. In our fourth episode, we consider Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. It's very helpful to divide memory loss with age into two categories. What is called age-related memory loss, normal aging, uh, or benign senescent forgetfulness, and the dementias. Now, the dementia that is most common is Alzheimer's disease. What do we understand about these diseases? Are there genes that have been identified that are important? Are there many little genes having small effects? Or are there single genes that have some larger effects? Uh, we also want to understand how do we approach these things in terms of treatment. Episode 4 of the Charlie Rose Brain Series 2, underwritten by the Simons Foundation, coming up. The Charlie Rose Brain Series is about the most exciting scientific journey of our time, understanding the brain. The series is made possible by a grant from the Simons Foundation. Their mission is to advance the frontiers of research in the basic sciences and mathematics. From our studios in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. Tonight, we continue our exploration of the human brain, looking at two of its most devastating diseases. They are Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. The central hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is loss of memory. Frontotemporal dementia, on the other hand, is characterized by behavior and language dysfunction. Both are degenerative diseases that take a disastrous toll, not only on those diagnosed, but everyone around them. Patients are robbed of their independence, their relationships, and their very identities. Alzheimer's is the most common degenerative brain disease. Today, more than 5 million Americans have it. It is predicted by 2050 there will be three times as many cases. Frontotemporal dementia, or FTD, is often misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's. Its effects are just as devastating. FTD is a cluster of progressive diseases which affect the regions of the brain that control behavior, language, and decision-making. Some people with it undergo dramatic changes in their personality. They often become socially inappropriate and impulsive. Others lose the ability to use and understand language. Remarkably, some patients with FTD can experience previously unknown bursts of intense creativity when frontal brain areas decline and posterior regions take over. At the moment, there is no cure or effective way to slow the progression of either Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia, but continued research has brought new insights into their diagnosis, pathogenesis, and potential treatment. Just a few weeks ago, after this program was recorded, two independent studies conducted by Columbia and Harvard were published that shed new light on how Alzheimer's progresses. They indicate the disease can spread from brain cell to brain cell like an infection. Dr. Scott Small is a co-author of the Columbia study. He appeared on the program on February 3rd to talk about these new developments. Uh, imagine three stages of Alzheimer's. The early stage, a patient dies, you do an autopsy, you find it primarily in area A. Another patient has more progressive symptoms, he dies, and you see uh, Alzheimer's in two areas and then in three areas. And that's always been known uh, for the last 20 years. And the question has always been, does area A jump to area B, jump to area C, or are they just different areas that are vulnerable mm -hmm. and they sort of pop in at different time, time points? Uh, and that's a very difficult question to answer uh, with human patients. And so what Karen Duff and I did uh, at Columbia and Brad Hyman at, at, at Harvard, we've, we've used genetic engineering to uh, introduce the pathology of Alzheimer's in area A in a mouse mm -hmm. and then track changes over time. That's the pathway. And that's the pathway. Now the pathway begins in an area called the enteronal cortex. It's a sub area of the hippocampus, a circuit mm -hmm. very important for memory as you've discussed in some of your brain series. Um, and so it starts in the hippocampus and then it spreads outside of the hippocampus. And that might account for why when we do follow patients with Alzheimer's, it begins with just very mild forgetfulness. But as the disease progresses, you start having other symptoms like language problems, etc. And how does it go from one cell in one region to another cell in another region? Well, you know, that's interesting. We don't know that. We have theories. What we, what the, the big news here is that we showed that it does. In other yeah. words, it wasn't clear that it did. Uh, and now that this has been shown, now it really really becomes an incredibly interesting question to ask exactly how does that happen. 
As I noted earlier, the New York Times story on the new developments on Alzheimer's and my interview with Dr. Small came after the program you're about to see. Tonight, we show you this remarkable group of scientists who joined me to talk about where we are in understanding and fighting these devastating diseases. Mark the Tessier Levine is president no, of the Rockefeller no, University. He also heads the Laboratory of Brain Development and Repair. Allison Go is a professor of genetics and psychiatry, as well as professor in genetics and in neurology at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. David M. Holzman is a Jones professor and chair of neurology at Washington University in St. Louis. Bruce L. Miller is professor of neurology and psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. And once again, my co-host is Dr. Eric Kandel. He is, as you know, a Nobel laureate, a professor at Columbia University and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. He gets our program off this evening by telling us what it is we are about to see and talk about. We're full of stories of Alzheimer's. Many people have been touched by it. their parents, or somebody, their grandparents. Uh, we know also that there's something called age-related uh, memory loss. Help me understand what we want to discover in this conversation. As you pointed out, it's very helpful to divide memory loss with age into two categories. What is called age-related memory loss, normal aging, uh, or benign senescent forgetfulness, and the dementias. Uh, benign senescent forgetfulness is part of the normal aging pro uh, process, just like your muscles might get weaker if you don't mm. exercise them a lot, you get a little bit stiffer, so there is a weakening with, with age. Um, this is in contrast to dementia, which is a progressive, much more uh, serious disease uh, uh, and um, has impact in other aspects in memory storage. With normal aging, there's good news. Uh, as we're going to hear from David Holtzman, uh, there are ways to counteract it. Running two television programs the same day is one way to do it. <laughs> see, that's, that, that, that's why I did it, see? That's exactly the reason. It wasn't as the money, it wasn't the opportunity, it wasn't you. ambition, it was counteract. That's the way to do it. You know, you once said to me, find new ways to use your brain that, that have not been challenged before, and there is this real is benefit. You know? This is doing it. This is very beneficial. So all those people who say, I'm working too hard, take that. <laughs> This, so this is very good news. In contrast, dementia, for which we have no cure at the moment, is real, as you pointed out, an epidemic. Uh, there are five million people that suffer from it right now. And if you go by age, there are three to four percent of people age 70 have dementia. Age 80, it's 20 percent. And age 90, 50 percent. Mm. It's just horrible. Uh, now, the dementia that is most common is Alzheimer's disease. In 1906, Alois Alzheimer described a case that he said was unlike anything he'd ever seen. A 51-year-old woman by the name of Augusta D. came to see him, and she had a memory loss, but she also had peculiar thoughts. She thought in almost an irrational way that her husband was complicated and she was getting very jealous of what he was doing. Uh, as time got on, she became suspicious about other people as well. She thought they might be out to get her. Her memory deteriorated even more. She began to have difficulty finding her way around her house. And after a while, she had to be hospitalized. And after about five years of hospitalization, she died. <clears throat> when she was autopsied, um, Alzheimer did the autopsy. He found the three characteristic features uh, that uh, David and, and Allison will describe characterize Alzheimer's disease. There's a shrinkage of the brain, particularly the cerebral cortex. There are depositions of plaques outside the nerve cell, and there are also uh, tangles within the nerve cell. Um, many people think that this is the only dementia as you pointed out, there are a number of other dementias, vascular dementia, as well as frontal temper dementia. A decade before Alzheimer's described uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Arnold Pick described frontal temporal dementia.
Uh, and as we'll hear from Bruce Miller and from Allison, it's a fantastically interesting disease because it involves, at least at the beginning, very selective regions. So in addition to memory loss, if you have damage to the frontal lobe, you have, as you indicated, a disinhibition. Mm -hmm. People who never drank before will start to drink. Those who never gambled before may start to gamble. Um, if it spreads back to the temporal lobe, to Broca's area, to Wernicke's area, you get involvement of language as well. And there are a number of things we want to know about this, which all of our participants, particularly Allison, will have a lot to say about it. And that is, what do we understand about these diseases? Are there genes that have been identified that are important? Are there many little genes having small effects? Or are there single genes that have some larger effects? Uh, we also want to understand how do we approach these things in terms of treatment, and we're fortunate with Mark here, who is not only an outstanding scientist, but actually was a leader of Genetech, which they develop drugs, has experience of how to bring drugs to, to, to market. And he can explain to us, which is very difficult to understand, why it is so difficult to bring a drug to market and why it's so extraordinarily expensive. So we're going to learn an enormous amount. Let me start uh, with David Holtzman and, and talk about sort of the, the difference between age-related and, and also Alzheimer's and also the difference between early onset Alzheimer's and, and late onset. All right, so a frequent question I often get from family members and patients is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And really dementia refers to a loss of memory and cognitive abilities that's sufficient to impair your function. And Alzheimer's disease, as Eric mentioned, is one of several different disorders that cause dementia. The other uh, common causes are strokes, um, Lewy body dementia, kind of Parkinson-like syndrome, and then frontotemporal dementia, which Bruce will talk about. So really, the, the difference between age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease, uh, while it's sometimes difficult right when something starts changing to tell, um, is very common as people age to have some trouble with names, mm -hmm. have a little slowing of thinking, have a little trouble with memory. But what's not normal is for someone to begin repeating themselves, to forget conversations, to have trouble with your checkbook when you never had trouble before. Those are really signs that something is wrong that's beyond normal aging. David, you made an interesting point that if you ver worry very much about your memory loss, you're unlikely to have Alzheimer's disease because you've got the insight that there's something wrong with your memory. Right. A, a lot of people uh, sometimes will be really worried about their memory and um, frequently will find that people that are really worried don't have Alzheimer's disease. Um, a lot of patients who develop Alzheimer's have some trouble with their insight, so they don't realize that they have a problem with their memory at all. Mm. Uh, th there's also this uh, Mel Goods video. What does that tell us? I think it's really, so Mel Goods was the former CEO of Warner Lambert, right. and uh, he gives insight uh, in a very poignant way of what it's like to start getting Alzheimer's disease, and I think that might be worth uh, us watching. Okay, let's take a look at that video. What do you do? when you talk with your doctor and your doctor says the following, the only words you don't want to hear, I'm sorry, you have early stage Alzheimer's. Not long ago, Nancy and I had to confront this reality. I remember my first reaction, but doc, I feel fine. In fact, I feel great. And my first thought was, I'll beat this. And after all, I'd had a pretty good track record of beating the odds. At the age of 30, I became Warner Lambert's youngest ever country manager. And I guess I caught some notice because after a string of leadership jobs, I was asked to run the company. In 1991, I became chairman of Warner Lambert. We went from a company with practically nothing in the pipeline to the enterprise that invented what is now the world's best-selling medicine, Lipitor. Remembering all the time I faced long odds and didn't blink, I wondered, why can't I beat Alzheimer's too? And then, over a few days, the reality set in. Alzheimer's disease is pitching a perfect game. I don't expect biomedical science to ride to my rescue. 
but I will go out a happy man if we can change the course of this disease for the hundreds of millions of people who will soon be at risk. So what should we take from that? Well, I think other than the powerful lesson yeah. uh, that his eloquent testimony gives is that as of now, Alzheimer's win. I really think that the amount of Which discoveries, is a bad way to say it, we'll yeah, win. the amount of discoveries that we've made, the field has made over the last 30, 35 years, really give us hope that we will eventually conquer this. And um, even if you look back at what Alzheimer first showed a hundred years ago in the slide. He described these classic lesions that we all talk about, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. You can see that in that circle is what's called an amyloid plaque, which consists of a normal protein called the amyloid beta protein. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next uh, arrow, you can see a neurofibrillary tangle. These two lesions at first were thought just to be byproducts of the disease. What we now know that they're fundamentally involved in the cause of the disease, which we'll talk about more as we go along. So one of the really fascinating things about these lesions that we've learned is that these lesions don't start forming in the brain when you first develop memory loss. They actually start about 15 years or so before you have any change in your memory or thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that in and of itself gives us great hope that if we can detect these things as they're occurring, we may be able to prevent ultimately the, the damage to the brain. You can see that these lesions, these amyloid plaques and tangles, don't form all over the brain. They actually form in very specific areas. So you can see that the amyloid begins to build up in, in parts of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in problem solving. And you can also see it build up in the temporal parietal cortex, which is our regions involved in uh, memory, uh, it's connected to memory areas. And when this first builds up, the brain's able to compensate, and there's quite a bit of reserve the brain has so that people seem fine for a while. You can't mm -hmm. tell the difference between somebody who has these lesions initially and not. But then over time, as more and more damage builds up in the brain, you can see that the brain begins to shrink because the nerve cells and their connections are being lost and, and damaged. And regions like the hippocampus, which is very important for memory, just gets very small as the nerve cells are gone. And so I think what we've really learned, that's sort of what a pathologist has seen under a microscope. You can now see some of these things with imaging. Uh, but what we've learned a lot about in the last 25 years is really the underlying science about this disease. And while we certainly don't know everything, we do have a lot of insights that the field has made. For example, this amyloid protein, which accumulates in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease, is shown in red. We know that it's derived from a much larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein, which sits inside the cell membrane. And a lot of interesting science went around figuring out how is it that this amyloid beta protein, the red part of that figure, actually gets separated from the amyloid precursor protein. And it was figured out that there's enzymes One's called beta secretase that makes that beta cut. And there's another one called the gamma secretase, the gamma cut, such that these enzymes cleave the amyloid beta protein from that larger protein and forms the amyloid beta protein, or A beta. This, this A beta is made by all of us all the time. It's a normal product made by our brains. But what happens in Alzheimer's disease, or before it even starts, is this normally soluble protein that floats around clumps up and it forms aggregates. And when these aggregates start forming, they, there's a lot of evidence that they can become toxic to cells. And uh, that's one, that's a major theory that uh, is, is, appears to be the case in Alzheimer's disease. In any case, once this starts happening, not only can the amyloid damage the cell directly, another protein that's inside the cell called tau can also, right. normally it's soluble, it can begin to clump up and aggregate. And the combination of those two things happening appear to be play a very important part in the progression of the disease. Okay, let me turn to Dr. Yoda and, and talk about uh, the genetic consideration here. What we've learned about the disease, which is actually that um, there's a, looks like a single common pathway of disease. So these genes at the top there, the amyloid precursor protein, which David mentioned, and two other genes, presenilin-1 and presenilin-2, people can have uh, mutations in these genes that cause the disease and what we've understood understand is that these mutations 
lead to aggregate, uh, uh, um, increased production of mm. that A-beta fragment mm. that David was talking about. So that seems to be the earliest change that we can find in these people is so really pinpointing this beta amyloid protein as being central to the disease. And where is the focus of the genetic research and right where we're talking about right now? now? Yeah. So uh, right now, most of the research is on understanding risk factors for the rest of the cases, the 99.9% .9 of cases. Because they're not um, caused by a single gene defect. Exactly. They are likely to be caused by many genes of very small effect and also uh, potentially, obviously, uh, environmental factors may play some influence and comorbidities, other diseases that people have may I increase risk. But all of these uh, findings have actually pointed to this amyloid pathway. So whatever is, a, is the proximal cause of disease, it all filters into the same pathway that affects aggregation of this amyloid peptide and uh, ultimately uh, loss of cells and yeah. dementia. We don't know for certain whether this is, you know, the ultimate truth, as you pointed out, but it's a very powerful hypothesis that have been extremely useful in guiding research, and it's very reassuring because in other diseases we'll discuss, like schizophrenia or depression, you can't point to a single gene that can do it for you. So it's lots of little genes that seem to be responsible. Mm. And to figure out how those kinds of diseases work is much more difficult. So even though the progress at the moment seems to be very slow, our understanding of it has been really amazingly rapid. So we were right. able to make animal models, in fact, of, part, part, uh, of the disease by taking, these, by very taking these very genes and mutations and introducing them into a mouse. Uh, and that before that, there really was no small animal laboratory model uh, of disease. And so it made it extremely difficult so, for so scientists to study the disease. Explain what happened when you introduced them into the, to the mouse. As the mouse ages, there are changes um, in the brain that lead to aggregation of the same protein in the brain as you see uh, in humans. And in some of the mouse models, there's some suggestion there may also be um, some changes in memory uh, mm. in, in these animals. That it's not a perfect representation of the, the disease. The reason it's not a perfect but, mm -hmm. representation is that the mouse only lives to be two years old. Mm. Uh, while Alzheimer's, as David pointed out, you don't even see anything until the disease has been in present there for 15 years. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, so, and the majority of cases come after 65. Right. right. Yeah. And so we're encouraged with the animal models. Mm -hmm. We have to see that some early aspect of the disease is going on. They show some cognitive deficits. They have some motor disturbance. Mm -hmm. So it's very encouraging. Okay, let me turn to, to Bruce and talk about the differences here between Alzheimer's and, and frontotemporal uh, uh, dementia. Well, most people have never heard of frontotemporal dementia, and I think that's because uh, we didn't know much about it until yeah. recently. Uh, even the neurology textbooks used to say, don't pick Pick's disease, uh, uh, because they thought it was so rare um, and because they thought that we couldn't separate it during life from Alzheimer's disease. I think we've learned now that it's the most common uh, cause, along with Alzheimer's disease, for dementia in people under the age of 64, um, and continues uh, to be a significant presence even as we get over 65. So very common uh, in people who are young who have a dementia. Uh, as Allison will, will talk about, we know a lot about the genes now that cause this. They're different genes than Alzheimer's disease and also different proteins that aggregate in the brain. Mm -hmm. For me, it is uh, one of the most fascinating diseases imaginable. Um, it begins in uh, parts of the frontal lobe, very small areas that are involved with our social intelligence, our ability to inhibit impulses. Uh, if it starts on the left side, it begins in speech areas, so suddenly speech is affected. But uh, often what you see is uh, a profound disorder of uh, social behavior, moral reasoning. Um, you see people who were never disinhibited committing antisocial acts, uh, going uh, into stores, uh, taking things. Uh, we did a study uh, where we found that about half of our patients uh, early in the illness either uh, were arrested or could have been arrested for something that they did uh, associated with this new illness.
Other fascinating thing about this disease is it, is it hits the parts of the brain that allow us to relate to others, to sympathize and empathize with other people. So uh, we That's hear- That's the right side. That, that is the right side, absolutely. Yeah. And so you see these uh, people who were once loving who become cold and different to people around them. Um, they become addictive, they overeat, they begin to smoke when they'd never smoked before. So uh, th this is really a, a profound social disorder that uh, has a huge impact on a family. It hits people when they're younger. Uh, so these are often people who are working uh, at a critical point in their life. I would say often, if not uh, always, we see people make bad judgments around their finances. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, they become bankrupt, uh, often uh, become alienated from their loved ones. Are there specific genes that contribute? Yes. and. Um, uh, I think like Alzheimer's disease, it offers great hope for treatment. Well, let me come back then, Allison, tell me about the, the genetic right. composition of FTD. So from the genetics, what, uh, what we discovered was that in contrast to Alzheimer's disease, where so far all the evidence has pointed to a single common pathway, what we've discovered about frontotemporal dementia is that it's, it's uh, many diseases that, uh, as you can see, that we've actually identified uh, three different genes, but they cause a similar uh, clinical disease, but the pathology will look different, and uh, the genes that are altered uh, are different. And so you have parallel pathways where you have um, a clinically similar-looking disease, but uh, very different underlying causes. And so that has obviously big implications for the point of view of treatment, mm -hmm. where in Alzheimer's disease, one might expect that if you, have, if you can modify that central pathway that appears to be present in all of these diseases, you might be successful with a treatment that's targeting that, whereas in frontotemporal dementia, it's probably multiple diseases and we will need to, we'll mm -hmm. need to understand which form of frontotemporal dementia an individual has before thinking about treatment, because the treatment could be quite different. Before we go further, tell me the definition of dementia. Dementia is a loss of memory and aspects of cognitive function. Okay. It's a deterioration of cognitive function with an emphasis so on memory. So it's defined memory. as loss of memory yes. in a cognitive function. It, it's, it's more than memory. It's aspects of cognition. And it, and it needs to interfere with your social and occupational function. So right. it's, it has to be enough that it affects your daily life. Okay. Let's move to where you are in terms of some of the basic sciences and, and looking at discovery or, or of marketable and safe products. Right. So the, uh, maybe I can talk about um, progress in, in identifying drugs for exactly. Alzheimer's. Exactly. Uh, which are most advanced, but then you know later in the conversation perhaps we can come back to frontotemporal dementia and, and other things. Uh, there are of course uh, a few drugs that are already approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's, but they, they provide a modest benefit. Uh, they work by boosting the function of nerve cells that remain, um, so they can provide some benefit uh, in terms of brain function, but it's usually temporary because they don't um, target the underlying cause. Nerve cells continue to die, the brain continues to deteriorate, so while they can help some patients somewhat, they don't make a big dent in the disease. And what we need, uh, of course, are drugs that um, uh, slow or block the progression of the disease uh, by targeting the underlying mechanism. Mm. Now, unfortunately, several drugs that attempted to do that uh, have failed, and none has so far been successful. But what many um, are pinning their hopes on are drugs that target this central amyloid cascade mm. that um, Allison and David um, uh, discussed. Um, and more specifically, that A-beta peptide, the one that aggregates and forms plaques, uh, based on the assumption that A-beta or maybe small aggregates um, are bad actors um, that drive the disease and that have to be um, stopped. Now, um, it's taken a long time to develop drugs for um, uh, the target A-beta. Uh, drug discovery, of course, is inherently a uh, lengthy, costly, and risky business. Mm -hmm. What you can see here is that, on average, it takes about 14 or 15 years and about a billion dollars to make a drug. And um, the attrition is just massive. So uh, when you start with about two dozen, uh, two dozen projects uh, trying to make drug candidates, only about a dozen uh, drug candidates will come from that. Only about nine of them turn out to be uh, safe enough to enter human clinical trials. And only one, only one of nine, will make it all the way through to approval with the others failing either because uh, they proved to be unsafe or because they just don't work. Mm. 
Uh, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, there's a further hurdle, which is that there's a protective barrier that prevents most drugs from entering the brain, so you have to get around that as well. And so it's taken a long time to make drugs for A-beta. A-beta was discovered over two decades ago. Mm -hmm. It took almost a decade for people to figure out an approach that could enable us to get access to the A-beta in the brain. But the good news is that uh, applying that approach, there are now about half a dozen drugs in clinical trials, some of them in late-stage clinical trials. Uh, some of them have already shown um, that they can reduce the amount of plaque in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. And um, in this uh, calendar year, in 2012, uh, we should see the clinical results for at least one of them, with others um, uh, giving results in, in subsequent okay. years. It, and if those clinical trials are satisfactory, what will be the result? I mean, what, how well, will the, it the result would be um, a, a slowing of cognitive decline. Uh, so it's not like you can reduce the impact already of things of the decline then of the erosion or the destruction of. A lot right, of the, that is due to loss of nerve cells, and you yeah. can't get those cells. You back. can't get them back. There's no back, right, plasticity right. or regeneration or anything yeah. like that. There well, is some limited regeneration of nerve cells, but not in those regions of the brain. Not in most regions of the brain. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. So, uh, but excuse me, yeah. Mark. There's another hopeful sign yes. which you mentioned before, and that is. We're also improving techniques for detecting the disease earlier. So Correct. the combination of new insights into how to intervene therapeutically and getting at the disease earlier through better imaging, through mm. better ways of having markers in the blood. Uh, I think that that's absolutely a very important point, Eric. I think um, uh, one of the scientists' big, biggest concern with the ongoing trials is that they are in patients who are already symptomatic. But mm. as David mentioned earlier, those patients have had the disease progressing in their brains for years. And um, uh, many are arguing uh, that we should be uh, doing the trials in patients who are pre-symptomatic uh, based on the use of uh, new biomarkers that enable you to the detect the disease even before the symptoms appear. And David is a world expert on this and perhaps could comment on it. I think if you think of Alzheimer's disease a little bit like cardiovascular disease, we know that the plaques that build up in the heart that block the arteries take many years to build up. And some of the most effective treatments now to prevent a heart attack or a stroke is to take medications that lower cholesterol. Right. You get your cholesterol checked. Right. Well, we now have markers for Alzheimer's disease that tell you that the changes of Alzheimer's are occurring in the brain while you're still cognitively okay. Mm -hmm. And so in applying those, some of them are imaging. Some of them are checking the fluid in either the blood or, or what's worked the best so far is spinal fluid. We can really tell that somebody is likely going to develop Alzheimer's disease in the next few years. And I think if things like that are applied in clinical trials, maybe we'll actually be able to give things to actually delay or even prevent the disease. And I think that's where the big hope is. So, so that if you're able, successful in doing that, you'll be able to see it maybe after it's only five years into development or 10 years into That's development. Exactly without right. any symptoms. That's exactly without right. any symptoms. Right. And we can, I, there's good evidence we can do that now. Yeah. Um, so what, what's necessary to, to advance that whole So in, in theory, it's straightforward. You enroll exactly. a lot of normal people who are of a certain age and you assess these biomarkers and then you put them on a treatment or placebo and you mm -hmm. see if it delays the disease. The problem is it takes many years for somebody to progress. Even if they are going to develop disease, it might take yeah. three, four, five, six years. And so it's going to be very expensive to do these trials. And how e even a single pharmaceutical company, it might be very difficult for them to do that. And so we may need to come up with new models, maybe public-private partnerships or other, other new ways to be able to enable us to get a treatment. I think that really is the way to go, though. Or find surrogate markers so that you go early before symptoms appear, and you uh, give the drug, and you measure outcome not based on uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease per se, but on some further progression, pre-symptomatic progression of the disease. And just like cholesterol in your blood, you give a drug and you see if it gets lower, that would, this would, same type of thing could occur in Alzheimer's disease. Bruce, let me move this over to where you are. Right. So the frontotemporal dementia, I think, has uh, given us some incredibly exciting genes. Uh, yeah. One of them is called progranulin, and we've learned that uh, people, about 5% of frontotemporal dementia, carry this gene. Uh, it produces uh, uh, something called haploinsufficiency, which just means we don't get enough progranulin from the, from the bad gene. Mm -hmm. So this becomes, I think, one of the most plausible uh, areas to treat something. 
All you have to do is figure out a drug that will either increase the amount of progranulin in, in the blood and brain or figure out a way of delivering this protein. And so I think it becomes one of the simplest neurodegenerative diseases. And we're already beginning to think about treatment trials with drugs that we think will elevate uh, the progranulin levels in, in the blood and brain. Uh, talk about a, a bit ab about sort of the creativity and in, in, in the left-sided you know, damage there and, and what that tells us. Yes. So I, uh, 1996, I started to notice that uh, some of my patients all had a progressive aphasia. Uh, they hit the left frontal part of the brain or the left temporal lobe. Uh, there was a small percentage who suddenly, in the setting of this progressive language disorder, began to uh, show visual creativity. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think, a fascinating story about the brain. It tells us that uh, we have circuits and we turn one off and we may actually be turning other circuits on. And I think in some of these patients there is actually increased activity uh, in the posterior parts of the brain that uh, on the right side that are involved with creating art. I'd, I'd like to you know, talk a little bit about uh, Ann Adams who I think was our most extraordinary I experience. I love this story. Thank I you. I love this story. So um, Ann and uh, uh, her husband, both scientists, he was a mathematician and Ann was a, a biologist who studied uh, the uh, epithelium uh, of the ovary un under the cell. Uh, and suddenly um, decided that she didn't want to work in science and she began to create art. And what Anne uh, did initially was some static pictures. She hadn't used a paintbrush very much. But then I think her work built and it became more visually beautiful. And She became uh, obsessive about this. I mean, she all she wanted to do was go to the art studio yes. and, and look at... Ravel and whatever, I've forgotten who it was, yes. but, but and just that was her life. Exactly. Which is extraordinary. So scientist who becomes, yes. you know, more committed to art than she could ever have imagined. Yes, her, her whole life became art and painting. Because it had moved to her, the, a different section of her brain. We, we think so. We got a picture of Anne's brain before she ever uh, developed her language disorder, and we saw that already she was showing loss of tissue. Would, and this is, um, uh, she had loss of tissue initially in the left part of the brain involved with producing speech, but a larger right posterior parietal area, and which we think was involved with this burst of visual creativity. Sadly, the burst of visual creativity was really the beginning mm -hmm. of the frontotemporal dementia. So I, I wanted to uh, talk about a, a, this picture just... of Anne's, which uh, she used, she punned, as she said, unraveling bolero. Right. And um, uh, what she attempted to do was uh, capture in a visual way what uh, bolero does. Uh, and uh, bolero is a very rhythmic, repetitive, uh, compulsive piece, uh, very similar, I think, to the way Anne approached the art. Um, and and what, she did it note by note. She did it note by note. She took this 340 meter piece uh, that is highly repetitive with a progressive crescendo. And uh, she began initially uh, with the uh, beginnings of this uh, um, and showed in a snaky fashion how the crescendo builds. Uh, if the uh, note is longer, that means that uh, uh, Bolero uh, was producing a louder note. If it was wider, they played the note longer. And then um, uh, what you see uh, here is the sudden change in key, which uh, Anne uh, Adams was fascinated by. Um, and uh, so uh, suddenly we've gone from these dull blue and uh, uh, brown uh, keys to this flawdy, uh, f uh, f uh, gaudy fluorescent pink and orange. Um, uh, which is the beginning of the uh, crescendo and the stop of the music. And so Anne had done something that we have called transmodal association. She associated sound, rhythm, uh, auditory processes with a visual picture. But the sad thing is this is, uh, an, this is the beginning of the onset this is the, and the, the beginning, deepest implications. Absolutely. And, and the amazing thing for us, uh, we don't think it's a coincidence, is that uh, Ravel himself, uh, seven years before he produced Bolero, was beginning to have problems with writing. Um, and he uh, developed a progressive aphasia, we think identical to Anne's. Yeah. Seven years before Anne was diagnosed with progressive aphasia, she produced this uh, wonderful piece. Of course, neither of them knew about the other. Let me tie up, uh, Allison, with this idea of not only the genetic disorder with some kind of environmental impact. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. So, um, as you probably the nice uh, the 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 most well described example of how um, environment can play a role uh, relates to the most common risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, which is a particular form of a protein called apolipoprotein E or APOE for short. And uh, so that there's this protein comes in three forms and um, two, three, and four, bizarrely, mm. not one. And um, so the three is the most common form and that has no, is sort of neutral in terms of risk. The APOE4 form of this protein increases our risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, and the E2 allele will decrease one's risk for Alzheimer's disease. And what has been uh, observed is that if you have um, head injury mm. with loss of consciousness, if you have a, an E4 uh, uh, form of the protein, your outcome is much worse than if you have one of the other uh, forms of the protein. So this is an example of where an environmental factor, head injury, uh, can have a different impact on your risk for disease depending uh, on your underlying genes. Mm. Uh, and it's really a quite a substantial increase in risk. So people who have the APOE4 Right. form of the protein and have a head injury uh, can have a, a 15 to 20 fold increase in risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And okay. obviously, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say this what? has a big imp exactly oh, right. impact when you think about the sports Athletics. that people right, right. play where you contact sports where you, you With concussion have, seeming to be on the rise. E exactly. That's right. I mean, I think that this is uh, has significant uh, public health issues when you think about the number of people who are obviously at risk, putting themselves at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease or other dementias as a result. Okay, before I open this up to broader mm -hmm. questions, talk, talk to me finally about drugs and what we've learned in a sense, and the fact that if in fact the drug fails does not mean that it was, uh, that there are not lessons to be learned. That's right. So the, the, I mean, we've all already discussed how even the ongoing trials right now to target this A-beta peptide, uh, if they fail, is it because the theory was incorrect, as Eric pointed out, this is a theory, or is it because we intervened too late? Right. Uh, you know, had the horse already left the barn and, and closing the door won't, won't keep it in. Um, so uh, the, um, the, through these trials, we will see effects on, um, on amyloid. We'll see um, whether there's uh, behavioral uh, improvement and, and, and improvement in, in cognition. We'll be able to learn uh, you know, how uh, uh, good our theory is, and I think that's one thing that's going to happen over the next several years. At the same time, there's a, uh, as we, we target one specific mechanism there, I think it's very important that we continue to target other mechanisms. Uh, one of the great lessons of drug discovery is that it's rarely the case that by hitting one mechanism, you can get all the benefits you want, that you can get a ma magic bullet. Typically, you need combinations of drugs hitting different aspects of the mechanism. And I think a, a very important area in neurodegeneration in, in general is um, understanding once the disease is initiated with factors like a beta or progranulin, um, how does uh, the, uh, the death get executed? What are the executioners of the nerve cell death? Uh, it's thought that that tau protein that we heard about earlier uh, is involved in this. So drugs against tau are being made and developed. And I think as we learn more about that, we'll get more entry points for drug um, uh, development um, that can work uh, in a complementary fashion to the, the other drugs. And so when we look at the concentration of tau, what do we find in terms of, of the empirical evidence? Well, we see it increasing um, as uh, in, in, in spinal fluid, for example. It right. increases yeah. over time um, as the, the um, uh, disease progresses. Tau is interesting because it's in those tangles that David talked about initially, uh, neurofibrillary tangles in Alzheimer's disease. It increases in the spinal fluid. And you may have noticed on Allison's uh, genetic chart, in frontotemporal dementia, it's a causal gene. When it's mutated, you get frontotemporal dementia. And that points out one additional thing. These execution pathways may actually be a site where you could get drugs that works across dementias. Because they may start right. for different reasons, but they may come converge down to the same point. So a drug that targets tau may be useful both for Alzheimer's disease and potentially frontotemporal mm. dementia. Right. Uh, let, let's broaden this out and talk about the following, the cost of this. And in other words, I mean, there is huge societal cost. Enormous. Yeah. One forgets, and this is one of the things that Mark pointed out, these costs are true for cancer as well. 
it takes a long time to bring a drug to market. The reason the cost is so enormous here is because this is an epidemic. There are so many people suffer from it. Because as people the living to be older age. Yeah. As the population. What I was a medical student, this was not talked about. This is a disease of the last 50 years because people are really living a significant amount longer and therefore a dramatic increase in the number so of So when you were a medical student, there was not, no discussion of Alzheimer's? Practically not. Very rare, isn't it? Me neither. I, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, interesting in terms of societal cost, uh, currently the Alzheimer's Association um, uh, reports that the cost to society today in the United States alone is about $280 billion a year, and that's where money changes hands. <sighs> Um, uh, primarily through nursing care, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it doesn't involve in-kind care from families. Mm -hmm. It's estimated, uh, as David said, there's going to be a tripling of the population. By 2050, it's estimated the cost to the nation in today's dollars will be a trillion dollars a year. A trillion dollars a year. We're trying to squeeze a trillion dollars out of the budget over the next decade. Um, it shows you the, the magnitude of the potential economic impact, not to mention the human toll uh, from the disease. I think the country is beginning to realize this requires a national effort. And the government is actively becoming involved in it. Yeah. Uh, there are now plans that by a certain date, hopefully there will be significant progress on this. And one of the great questions for government uh, in 21st century is, is the cost of health care as a percentage of GDP and how to make uh, and more effective and, and um, more efficient uh, right. right. health care treatment. Right. Right. You know, right. and delivery right. of health care. Right. 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 Yeah. What is fascinating about Mel Goods is such an amazing guy. That first of all, he reminds me a little bit of, of President Reagan, who also came public with it, mm -hmm. realizing that it's not going to do much good for him, perhaps, but people will know what an important disease is. Mel Goods' company was involved as the first company trying to develop drug for Alzheimer's right. disease. Yeah. I, I've always thought that Reagan's decision and the eloquence of what he said yes. uh, yes. about Alzheimer's and the way he said it uh, was one of the significant contributions uh, that he made Absolutely. in the sense yes. of, Absolutely. of bringing attention Absolutely. because of the prestige of the yes. office and bring attention and, and recognition right. and, and in not a not sense... Not being embarrassed. Yeah, taking being embarrassed. the stigma away yeah. from you know, the disease. This is a disease. This is not bad behavior. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And, Go ahead. I was going to say one of the real tragedies now is that um, we had a spokesperson at that time. We don't really have a spokesperson at the moment for Alzheimer's disease and suddenly we have these incredibly powerful biological approaches that we think are poised to make a difference for our society, and we are not getting the NIH funding. And uh, so, you're worried that there is opportunity that we may we may miss the chance to to activate. Exactly. We finally have the discoveries. Now we really need to act and and yes. get get yes. treatments that are yes. effective. Yes. We're right at the point to do it. And it, and the need is so large that only government can provide, or primarily can provide, the kind of resources necessary. That's true, although it pro it there probably has to be more system. than other more things than that as yeah. well. Yes, and, but government has to be involved. It's yeah, of such a large right. size. Yeah. And what is tragic is that with the cutback in government spending, research is being hit particularly hard. Yeah. Now, we're fortunate that people like the Lauders are interested in Alzheimer's disease, and actually that's where Mel Good spoke, of drawing people's attention to it. So private philanthropy is stepping in in an important way, but it can never substitute for what the government can do. Now, I still don't, I'm not clear, because, I mean, we hear all the time that we should all be doing things to make our brain more active. I'm, I'm not sure that I understand what is the hard empirical evidence of doing that. If you keep your mind active, and actually being in good health, mm -hmm. keeping blood pressure under control, keeping diabetes under control. These are protective factors against age-related memory loss. So age-related memory loss is something we can actively do something about. Mm -hmm. That's just a question of getting the word out. Uh, as we have made very clear here, uh, and everyone knows, there are more and more you meet people that have some way been connected to either uh, some kind of dementia or whether it's, it's Alzheimer's itself. So we are aware here in terms of, of the research and the possible breakthroughs in the near term. Let's tick them off. I think we really understand a lot, not everything, about what underlies the disease. And we are at a point where new treatments that are being developed now are, being, are in people for the first time right. that really attack the mechanism and uh, we're probably going to have to also treat earlier. And that's where there's real hope to really delay or prevent the disease. And that should happen in the upcoming 10, 15 years. Could you but summarize some of the markers that are available? 
Some of the changed. markers yes. for the disease include being able to image amyloid in the brain of a living right, person. Right. You can also see markers not only of amyloid. So we can do that now. We can do that now. We mm. can also in the spinal fluid detect whether the brain's beginning to degenerate by measuring proteins like tau that right, Mark had right. mentioned. And uh, combining these things together, you can really detect roughly when somebody's likely going to develop the disease. Mm. But I think it's worth pointing out that the, the, uh, the, the progress has been very exciting in terms of the basic science and even more exciting seeing it move towards the clinic with these experimental drugs. But there's still many, many things we don't know. Uh, for example, how it is that the nerve cells are actually dying, which if we knew it, would enable the next generation of drugs. So while we move forward with the current mm -hmm. drugs that are in the clinic that are going to mature in the coming years, in the coming decade, we also have to keep at it to get additional drug targets. We do not know why the nerve cells are dying. We know but, they're dying, we don't know why. But, well, the, the, it depends what why is. At the, at the, <laughs> in terms of the why, they're dying because of the, the triggers at the top, whether right. it's progranulin, oh. a beta, other things. We don't understand how it is that the nerve cells get dismantled. What's the program of suicide inside the nerve cells at a biochemical level? If we knew that, we could try to intervene and block it. Mm -hmm. and, and how far away do you think we are from that, just to ask you a kind of locker room question? Uh, you never want to make predictions in science, but it's if I had to make one, yeah. um, it's, uh, I think we're poised to, to uh, make a lot of progress in coming years because a lot of insight into how cells die have arisen over the past decade and two decades that are converging on an understanding in nerve cells. Eric, Eric, he makes a very good point, which we've made repeatedly here. Uh, the brain is a marvelous organ, and we like to think that we understand it completely. We're extremely far from doing that. It's been obvious it's in all of our programs. Proved. And this is even more true in terms of treatment. These are extremely difficult problems, and it's going to take a long time to really tackle them. But one has to realize that molecular biology wasn't applied to the brain until 1980. That imaging techniques, when we were house officers, x-rays, the most primitive techniques for visualizing, and you didn't really visualize the brain, you visualized the vasculature, you visualized the bones, you didn't visualize the actual brain until brain imaging, PET scanning and fMRI came along. That's what, 30 years. I'm always struck by how, no matter how sophisticated the science and the biochemistry and, and whatever it is, you know, it, it is always ripe with fundamentals, very basic fundamentals, unless you understand why the nerve cells right. are doing that. You can't even go to understanding how to address the issue. That's right. Yes. So let me do something we always do here and, and with sort of interesting kind of results. And we may have already been on it with you, and it is this question of it, what is the th most important question that you'd like to see answered? most important question I'd like to see answered is uh, the, uh, how it is that the nerve cells die in these diseases. I really want to know if you treat the disease with um, these really at attractive mechanism-based therapies, whether you can delay the disease. Whether you can delay Delay the onset of the disease, mm -hmm. which would be effectively preventing it. And you're optimistic that we will? I'm very optimistic. In the I, near term? I think in the next 10 to 20 years, yeah. I think That's we'll have near some. near term. Yeah. Um, so I spent 30 years working on diagnosis, right. and I don't want to work on that. I think we're good at it now. I want to spend uh, the rest of my time showing that we can treat frontotemporal dementia, and I'm very optimistic today. today. Um, I think that uh, this is going to be like cancer. We're not going to treat all cancer at the yeah. same time. We're going to pick off different subtypes of frontotemporal right. dementia, right. Alzheimer's disease, one by one. And I think with progranulin and the tau-related uh, problems of FTD, I think we really are making some headway. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I uh, would agree with Dave, and I, I think that maybe a combination of of knowing our genetic background, our genetic risk factors in combination with these biomarkers is really going to be something that will allow us to identify people who are at most at risk at the earliest possible times to allow these uh, treatments to be used to prevent disease rather than to be curing us of disease. Memory is your game. I have nothing to contribute to <laughs> these deep <laughs> insights. My thing is memory. And what I like is Bruce's finding that there's an increase in creativity in some patients with damage to the left hemisphere as a result of frontal temporal dementia. That, I think, is so profound because there is an idea that Tulings Jackson, one of the founders of neurology, right. had is that the left hemisphere inhibits the right hemisphere. If you remove that inhibition, the right hemisphere, which he claimed was more creative than the left, emerges yeah. more powerful. Yeah. And we've seen this with Chuck yeah. Close, that various diseases release certain plasticities yeah. in the brain. They're yeah. quite and remarkable. my great inquiry was that how do you release it without having to, to limit the other one, see, to yes. the left, our right side.
Thank you very much. Great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.